This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa. Michael. Sirwa, S I R O I S, dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Four Modern Times. Trinco. Book Four, Chapter Three. The Journey of Dr. Abnubil. After a succession of amazing vicissitudes, the memory of which is in great part lost by the wrongs of time and the bad style of historians, the Penguins established the government of the Penguins by themselves. They elected a diet or assembly, and invested it with the privilege of naming the head of state. The latter, chosen from among the simple Penguins, wore no formidable monster's crest upon his head, and exercised no absolute authority over the people. He was himself subject to the laws of the nation. He was not given the title of king, and no ordinal number followed his name. He bore such names as Patour, Jean Vion, Trafaldine, Coquenhot, and Bredouille. These magistrates did not make war. They were not suited for that. The new state received the name of Public Thing, or Republic. Its partisans were called Republicanists, or Republicans. They were also named thingmongers and sometimes scamps, but this latter name was taken in ill part. The Penguin democracy did not itself govern. It obeyed a financial oligarchy, which formed opinion by means of the newspapers, and held in its hands the representatives, the ministers, and the president. It controlled the finances of the republic, and directed the foreign affairs of the country as if it were possessed of sovereign power. Empires and kingdoms in those days kept up enormous fleets. Penguinia, compelled to do as they did, sank under the pressure of her armaments. Everybody deplored, or pretended to deplore, so grievous a necessity. However, the rich, and those engaged in business or affairs, submitted to it with a good heart, through a spirit of patriotism, and because they counted on the soldiers and sailors to defend their goods at home, and to acquire markets and territories abroad. The great manufacturers encouraged the making of cannons and ships through a zeal for the national defense, and in order to obtain orders. Among the citizens of middle rank, and of the liberal professions, some resigned themselves to this state of affairs without complaining, believing that it would last forever. Others waited impatiently for its end, and thought they might be able to lead the powers to a simultaneous disarmament. The illustrious Professor Abnubil belonged to this latter class. War, said he, is a barbarity to which the progress of civilization will put an end. The great democracies are pacific, and will soon impose their will upon the aristocrats. Professor Abnubil, who had for sixty years led a solitary and retired life in his laboratory, whither external noises did not penetrate, resolved to observe the spirit of the peoples for himself. He began his studies with the greatest of all democracies, and set sail for New Atlantis. After a voyage of fifteen days his steamer entered, during the night, the harbor of Titanport, where thousands of ships were anchored. An iron bridge thrown across the water and shining with lights stretched between two piers so far apart that Professor Abnubil imagined he was sailing on the seas of Saturn, and that he saw the marvelous ring which girds the planet of the old man and this immense conduit bore upon it more than a quarter of the wealth of the world. The learned penguin, having disembarked, was waited on by automatons in a hotel forty-eight stories high. Then he took the great railway that led to Gigantopolis, the capital of New Atlantis. In the train there were restaurants, gaming rooms, athletic arenas, telegraphic, commercial, and financial offices, a Protestant church, and the printing office of a great newspaper which latter the doctor was unable to read, as he did not know the language of the New Atlantans. The train passed along the banks of great rivers, through manufacturing cities which concealed the sky with the smoke from their chimneys, towns black in the day, towns red at night, full of noise by day and full of noise also by night. Here, thought the doctor, is a people far too much engaged in industry and trade to make war. 
I am already certain that the new Atlantans pursue a policy of peace, for it is an axiom admitted by all economists that peace without and peace within are necessary for the progress of commerce and industry. As he surveyed Gigantopolis, he was confirmed in this opinion. People went through the streets so swiftly propelled by hurry that they knocked down all who were in their way. Obnobile was thrown down several times, but soon succeeded in learning how to demean himself better. After an hour's walking, he himself knocked down an Atlantan. Having reached a great square, he saw the portico of a palace in the classic style, whose Corinthian columns reared their capitals of arborescent acanthus seventy meters above the stylobate. As he stood with his head thrown back, admiring the building, a man of modest appearance approached him and said in Penguin, I see by your dress that you are from Penguinia. I know your language. Uh, I am a sworn interpreter. This is the Parliament Palace. At the present moment the representatives of the States are in deliberation. Would you like to be present at the sitting? The doctor was brought into the hall, and cast his looks upon the crowd of legislators, who were sitting on cane chairs with their feet upon their desks. The President arose, and in the midst of general inattention, muttered rather than spoke the following formulas which the interpreter immediately translated to the doctor. A war for the opening of the Mongol markets being ended to the satisfaction of the states, I propose that the accounts be laid before the Finance Committee. Is there any opposition? The proposal is carried. The war for the opening of the markets of Third Zealand being ended to the satisfaction of the states, I propose that the accounts be laid before the Finance Committee. Is there any opposition? The proposal is carried. Have I heard aright? asked Professor Abnubil. What? You, an industrial people, and engaged in all these wars? Certainly, answered the interpreter. These are industrial wars. Peoples who have neither commerce nor industry are not obliged to make war. But a business people is forced to adopt a policy of conquest. The number of wars necessarily increases with our productive activity. As soon as one of our industries fails to find a market for its products, a war is necessary to open new outlets. It is in this way we have had a coal war, a, a copper war, and a cotton war. In Third Zealand we have killed two-thirds of the inhabitants in order to compel the remainder to buy our umbrellas and braces. At that moment a fat man who was sitting in the middle of the assembly ascended the tribune. I claim, said he, a war against the Emerald Republic, which insolently contends with our pigs for the hegemony of hams and sauces in all the markets of the universe. Who is that legislator? asked Dr. Obnubil. He is a pig merchant. Is there any opposition? said the President. I put the proposition to the vote. The war against the Emerald Republic was voted with uplifted hands by a very large majority. What? said Obnubil to the interpreter. You have voted a war with that rapidity and that indifference? Oh, it is an unimportant war which will hardly cost eight million dollars. And men? The men are included in the eight million dollars. Then Dr. Obnubil bent his head in bitter reflection. Since wealth and civilization admit of as many causes of wars as poverty and barbarism, since the folly and wickedness of men are incurable, there remains but one good action to be done. The wise man will collect enough dynamite to blow up this planet. When its fragments fly through space, an imperceptible amelioration will be accomplished in the universe, and a satisfaction will be given to the universal conscience. Moreover, this universal conscience does not exist. End of chapter 3 And the end of book 4